We'll move on. We'll come back for chapter nine. Uh, chapter nine is about rental properties, recording expenses, revenues, vacation homes, Schedule E. Chapter, uh, rental activities goes into Schedule E. So um, if someone has rental revenues and expenses, it does not go in Schedule C in any shape or form. It goes in Schedule E. Okay, so let's keep going, see how much we can go with this chapter. Uh, we are trying to understand the rental incomes and expenses. Um, also, um, talking about vacation home uh, and the um, situations that will arise because of that. And uh, some passive activity rules that we're going to look at. Um, to see what that means, and also maybe look at the schedule E down the road. Okay, so let's go to the next page. So, that residential rental properties, and those residential rental properties, they get depreciated uh, as a residential property, which is normally 27 and a half year makers. And what is the dwelling unit? Dwelling unit is a property that provides basic living uh, accommodations like kitchen, bathroom, toilet. Um, so it's a complete unit. Um, Houses are dwelling apartments, condominiums, mobile homes. It's a dwelling, uh, motor homes, yachts, because yachts, they have also kitchen and bathroom. Um, but the hotel or motel, that's not a dwelling. That's not a residential property. It's a commercial property. So it's not uh, the discussion in this scenario. Uh, hotel and motel, it's a separate business. Uh, so you are going to have rental income when we rent our places, right? So in this example, it says uh, Brent rents property he owns to a tenant for $500 a month. In November, the tenant installs a ceiling fan valued at $100. Brent reduced the tenant's December rent by $100 because of that. So that $100 is part of the rental income. So Brent's rental income equals $6,000, which is 11 months times $500 plus one month, $400 plus $100 of improvement that um, he got on his property. Uh, Brent can uh, normally should capitalize the uh, and depreciate the ceiling fan. You know why we're capitalizing? We have two types of expenses, re uh, uh, revenue expenditure and capital expenditure. Revenue expenditure are expenditure that you expense in order to operate on a daily basis. Let's say utility expense, uh, let's say property tax. Uh, but you capitalize those expenses that has a longer life. Uh, so because a ceiling fan has a longer life, normally you need to capitalize them. Uh, however, if something is like that cheap, let's say hundred bucks, you can use the IRS ruling, uh, which up to $2,500 of expenses, uh, capital expenses might be, uh, expense in that year and you don't need to uh, capitalize them and depreciate them down the road. But you have to identify that you are using that rule for that purpose. Because it's the minus, that's what it means. Not a big rule. Um, if you are a cash uh, payer, so usually rents payments are received in cash, right? Um, so if you're a cash payer, 
uh, uh, cash uh, method taxpayer. Uh, all rents that you receive, normally they are cash and uh, that's how you recognize that. However, uh, if you are accrual basis taxpayer, if you receive any rent, also it needs to get recorded as revenue in the same period. Even though if it's a, if it is a prepaid rent. So you might say, oh, I'm a cruel tax method cash payer. So the prepaid rent should be recognized in future. Uh, IRS says, no, doesn't matter. If you receive future rent in advance, that is a rent income for this period and you have to recognize it right now. Um, Oh, here is an example for that. So in December, the taxpayer received $600 for rent uh, that is going to be for next month, January of 2022. So the $600 will be reported as rent income in 2021 under both cash and accrual method taxpayers. Got it? But that, that does not apply to uh, security deposit. Because security deposit is specifically for security deposit. Let's say the tenant leaves and they break something in the, uh, in the rental property and you have to fix that and deduct from the deposit. That's the reason. Um, but if you, let's say you received, um, Wait, I'm sorry. So I know the AIG. A, what is it? Rent. Rent income. Yes. Like if you had to fix something. It will become a so-called. Uh, you record that as uh, paid rent, and then on the other hand, you record that as maintenance expense. Oh, definitely. So you have to record two things: hundred dollars rent the security deposit that you converted to rent income, and then immediately you record $100 as rent expense, uh, as maintenance expense. Yes. Is it, um, does it lower, is it, does it lower rate the gross income or adjust the The what, security deposit? Rental income. Rental income will be uh, added to schedule E and then Schedule E goes into Form 1040 for the uh, property owner. So it will increase the income on Form 1040. Okay. Yeah. But let's say you have $50,000 rent income and you have $45,000 expenses. So 50 minus 45, it's $5,000 net rent income and that five thousand dollars net rent income goes in schedule um, from schedule e to form 1040. okay so here is another example connie enters into five years lease uh, to rent property she owns on july 1st of 2021 Connie receives $6,000 for the first year rent and $6,000 for uh, last year rent. So that's advanced. But because IRS doesn't like that, says doesn't matter. You have to record $12,000 as rental income. Doesn't matter that rent is for first year lease or last year lease. Same thing. Uh, and sometimes you... Uh, you know, collect, you rent your property, you say, I want first year, first month rent, last month rent, and security deposit. Let's say first month rent is $1,000, last month rent is $1,000, and $500 security deposit. So first month and last month rent, you receive today, all the way, 2,000 goes into your income. $500 security deposit will stay as a uh, security deposit 
on which tail. doesn't get listed anywhere until it's either used or it doesn't list it anyway. back and it's never recorded. Never recorded until five years later, the tenant leaves and uh, when he leaves, you end up by a situation that you have to deduct $300 from that $500 because the uh, condo was not painted. Because you give them a painted condo, you, you they have to paint the condo again and give it back to you, like the way they received on day one. So, but they left, they didn't paint it. And you tell them, oh, if you live like this, I'm gonna deduct 300 bucks. They say, no problem. Okay, so you're gonna fill up that form uh, um, and show that the $300 has been deducted from your $500 security deposit. And uh, that's because of uh, rain, uh, painting the property uh, the, inside the condo. And uh, here is the check, $200 left. Uh, make a copy, send the, mail the check to tenants' future address, whatever address they gave you, and keep that document. And now you record $300 as rental income coming from security deposit, immediately record $300 maintenance expense, and that, that will wash each other, uh, but it has to be recorded that way, so. What happens to the security deposit if the person passes away? And you don't return it? Yeah, and they don't have anyone to return the money to you. Then God bless America, right? So you keep it in your pocket. You recognize $500 of security deposit, right? In, that will become a revenue because you hold it. Moment he dies and you hold that $500 security deposit, it's yours. It's income. You record uh, $500 rent income from leftover security deposit and that's it. And in case you get audited, you show that, hey, you know, that was $500 security deposit, he died. I didn't return it to anyone, so I record it as income. Yeah, that's good. That's good news. Um, Of course, sometimes they don't leave and you have to spend money to get rid of your tenants. In that case, all those expenses will be legal expenses that you have to uh, hire a lawyer, pay legal fees to uh, kick your tenants out. And then you are end up ending up with the properties all messed up. You have to spend a lot of money to fix it, paint it and everything else. Those will be all rental expenses that you will put in Schedule E. Okay, let's read this one. Taxpayers can deduct against rental income all ordinary expenses related to rental property. Examples of common rental expenses include what? Advertising, cleaning, utilities, real estate taxes, mortgage interest, insurance premium, because you have to pay for property insurance, right? Management fees, if any, uh, necessary travel and transportation that you have to go to your property, come back. The moment that you go to your property to take care of things and come back, that's part of the transportation. So you can uh, uh, you know, deduct your, uh, let's say, uh, mileage or something like that. Or, uh, or or just gas expenses, let's say. Um, or if you have to travel by airplane to another state because you have a property over there. So other rental expenses includes repair, maintenance, and depreciation. Accrual basis taxpayers take deduction in year the service are received or assets are used. So if you receive a service from a vendor, like a painter, a handyman. If you received it, um, then you deduct, you know, that expense as an expense. Uh, maybe you pay a month later, but which is January, but still you record that expense in the month of December because they finished the job in month of December. Um, 
cash basis taxpayers deduct rental expenses in the year expenses are paid except for prepaid expenses, which are spread over the period benefited. So if handyman fix your property, paints your property and um, let's say the handyman says, um, And the handyman finished the job in December. He gives you an invoice, let's say $1,000. And you say, okay, um, I, will, I will send you a check, but right now it's December, it's a little bit busy time. I will send you a check next month. But next month falls in January of next year, right? So if you are a cash basis taxpayer, you will not recognize any $1,000 maintenance expense because you didn't pay yet. So in 2021, there is no thousand dollars maintenance expense for a cash basis taxpayer because you didn't pay. You will recognize it in year 2022 when you pay that. However, if you are a cruel basis of cash payer, you're using a cruel basis and you receive the invoice from your handyman for the job you finished, thousand dollars you record expense in December of 2021. I know you're gonna pay it in January of next year, but you recognize it in December. So it depends if you are accrual basis of taxpayers or uh, cash basis. But here says the last sentence except for prepaid expenses which cash basis taxpayers spread over the period benefited. So this is what it means. Let's say in December, you give prepaid $1,200 to your gardener that he comes back every month, starting January through end of December next year, every month, $100 to do the gardening in your property. And you pay them in advance in December. Don't think if you are cash basis taxpayer and you pay $1,200 in advance to your gardener for the next 12 months, you can recognize $1,200 maintenance expense in December of 2021. No, uh, because you that's for prepaid maintenance for the next 12 months. Guess what? Next 12 months, you can re recognize that $100 a month maintenance expense. You cannot recognize anything in December 2021, even though you are cash basis taxpayer, and even though you paid all of that in advance. The reason they did that, because uh, you cannot play game. Uh, so let's say this year you don't want to show too much income, you pay your expenses in advance, and all of a sudden in December you show a lot of rental expense, so you have less income and pay less taxes. You can do it. That's confusing though, because isn't that the whole thing of cash? But like, what what are the cash things you can pay in advance that you don't have to spread over the period benefited? Like insurance and mentions. Again, yeah. Let's say prepaid insurance. You in December you buy a property insurance uh, for twelve hundred dollars. And it goes for one year. And it goes for one year, right? But you cannot say, oh, I'm a cash basis taxpayer. I paid $1,200. But then what is, that is the whole point of cash basis, isn't it? What, what, what is the difference? What can you prepay for, which is what cash basis is, that you're paying for it when you pay for it, even if for next month. What is the point in which you can actually put that expense in? So for rental properties, IRS doesn't let you do that. So then why do they say there's cash basis? There is no cash basis. Yes, it is. Let's say you have a business mm -hmm. and you have a mechanic shop and you have uh, you are a cash basis taxpayer mechanic shop. So income, you, somebody and, paid you for work that you're going to And you work. pay $1,200 to your gardener to come to clean up your mechanic shop, the green area, um, $100 a month. 
you are a cash basis taxpayer. In that case, that $1,200, it is uh, maintenance expense for year 2021. But if you are a rental property owner, IRS doesn't want you to do that. So that's what I'm saying. I was for rental property, there is no cash basis. It is. Uh, but it is cash basis, but it says don't take advantage of it. But what is the what is one thing that you could pay for on a cash basis that you can deduct? That's for next month. Here. Uh, okay, so let's say we have two people. One of them is cash basis. One of them is accrual basis. And let's read this one more time. So accrual basis taxpayers take deduction in the year the service is received. Okay, so accrual basis taxpayers, they receive a service, let's say handyman paints your home and they receive an invoice, but they didn't pay yet. Make sense? They receive an invoice, they didn't pay yet. So for work to be done on your property is the only thing. The work is done already. And you, the oil, property owner received an invoice from the handyman, but didn't pay yet, wants to pay in January. So IRS says, because you're accrual basis taxpayer, you have to recognize if something accrued and expense accrued already. So because expense accrued, then you recognize the expense, even though you didn't pay yet. Okay. So there's no prepayment expenses? But, uh, but, the same scenario for the say, say another rental property. That rental property owner is cash basis. Again, the same handyman went to his property. He painted the home and he gave him an invoice. And uh, But the cash basis taxpayer says, I'm going to pay you in January. IRS says, okay, since you are a cash basis taxpayer and you are not going to pay right now, then you can recognize that expense only in January when you pay that. But if you pay today, if you pay right now, guess what? You can recognize expense right now because the job is complete and you paid. Okay. But it's going to be accepted for two days. That's <laughs> the prepaid expense is for reason to prevent yeah. people from uh from paying too many, too much prepaid expenses and trying to push all expenses in December to manipulate the tax yeah. situation. So IRS said don't 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 play smart with me. Of course, you can pay prepaid expenses for December and immediately recognize because you paid for it, no problem. Um, okay, so repair and maintenance, it is something that keeps your property in a good condition, like fixing a leak or repairing a screen, something like that, okay? Uh, but if something is for long-term, like changing the roof, that's that means you have to capitalize. You cannot call it ex maintenance expense. That's, um, or changing your air conditioning, let's say. Uh, that's capitalizing. If changing something that works for a long term, um, prolongs, here is the word, prolongs its useful life. That's, that means you are capitalizing. Um, Again, uh, the depreciation um, or any improvement you made to the property has to be depreciated, right? Rental property goes 27 and a half for makers. But if you like to use uh, alternative depreciation uh, system, 30 years is also available. Straight line 30 years available. Yes. So in terms of the maintenance versus improvement, if the house you bought already has air conditioning and it broke and you were just going to replace that, would that be a repair or an improvement? Improvement. Because that unit is going to go for a very long time. Okay. So you normally you depreciate that for um, as improvement. 
Uh, I think five years you can uh, depreciate that, um, or you can just add it to the value of your property and use it 27 and a half years um, depreciation. How, how do they know what? They don't know until you show a uh, repair and maintenance expense of $5,000. And then they say, I never did that before. Your repair and maintenance expense is always about $1,500. How come all of a sudden you have $5,000 repair and maintenance? What did you buy? And that's where you get caught. Residential rental property. If something is your but own, I mean, home, yeah, your own home. That doesn't. No, your own home. If you um, put something like capitalization, like a new roof, new air conditioning, something like that, normally you keep the receipt because let's say you bought the home for a million dollars mm -hmm. and then you spend twenty thousand dollars for roof and ten thousand dollars for air conditioning so you keep that twenty thousand roof and thousand dollars air conditioning as improvement and you just hold on to it as a report because now your basis of your own home is $1,030,000. Mm -hmm. And three years later, all of a sudden, you sell it. You sell it for $1,100,000. So IRS says, oh, wait, your basis is $1 million. You will say, no, my basis is $1 million plus $20,000 roof, $10,000 air conditioning. So my basis is $1,030,000. And then IRS says, okay, then what's your capital gain? You say 1,100,000 minus 1,030,000, my capital gain is 70,000. However, because I lived in this house for more two years at least for the last five years, and I am married finding jointly, then I have $500,000 exclusion. So technically now I have no capital gain whatsoever. Let's change the scenario. You sold the house three years later or five years later, whatever, uh, for $1,600,000. Then IRS says, okay, what's your purchase price? You say 1 million. Then IRS says, okay, well, then you have $600,000 capital gain. You say no, 1 million plus $20,000 roof plus $10,000 AC, that's 1 million 30. 1 million 30 minus 1.6 million, it is $570,000 capital gain minus $500,000 exclusion for merit filing jointly for personal home. So my capital gain ends up to be only $70,000 and you pay taxes for capital gain long term $70,000 whatever tax it is, which is like probably about 20%. So if you were paying someone to just fix the air conditioning, that would be a repair. But if you're paying someone to install a new one, that would be the capital. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it is fixed, like fix what? 500 bucks? Yeah, that's a fix. But if, uh, if normally it's more than that, the air conditioning guy gonna say, hey, your unit is too old. Uh, it doesn't work to fix it. It's gonna cost more than that. So it's better to change the new unit. At that moment, that's a capitalization. Okay, so what else we were here? Um, let's see, bonus depreciation. Yes, you can use bonus depreciation um, for furnishing. If you have a rental furnishing, you know, like couch or um, refrigerator or something like that, then you normally can use bonus depreciation if available. Um, if not, anyway, you gotta use it for five years property for furnishing, which is couch, rental, refrigerator, gas range, 
gas or something like that. If ADS is elected, then nine years recovery period is for rental furnishing. Okay, um, Neil says that if you like to go back to ADS, it's not in chapter eight anymore. Your book changed. It is in chapter six. Just to, in case you want to look at the ADS. Um, oh, something. Um, if the ex, uh, capitalization, let's say you put a fan, ceiling fan is capitalization, right? So, it's kind of gray area exactly what should be capitalized, what should be expensed. So IRS says, um, I'm gonna give you some, if it is the minus type of expense up to $2,500 or less, then go ahead and expense it right away, no problem. Okay. It says up to 5,000 if they have applicable financial statements, that means it's audited. But in general, it's 2,500, that's what it is. Or, or it says small taxpayers, which they are not like big rental properties, small taxpayers uh, who have assets uh, that is not more than $10 million, and no more than 10 million annual gross receipts. So definitely small taxpayers. They can um, uh, use this diminished type of things. Uh, but there is also one more thing. It says uh, there's a regulation uh, for landlords that says um, says uh, 10,000 or 2%, let's say. Uh, uh, it says uh, here. The million dollar limit is applied to each rental building. So if your building is not more than $1 million cost, you can use this regulation. Uh, they, they call it safe harbor, and you can uh, use up to lesser of $10,000 expense or 2% of unadjusted basis of the building. You can use that uh, to recognize expense, even though it's a capitalization. But you have to choose that safe harbor as the way you like it to be. And if you choose it safe harbor, then after that, you are always under safe harbor. You cannot choose safe harbor for one year and then say, no, I don't want it anymore. So uh, you have to choose your uh, the way you like to do it. But other just the basis would be just the purchase cost. Yeah, purchase cost. Yeah, let's say your house. If your house is you purchased for a million dollars or less, you can go with safe harbor. What is two percent of one million? Twenty thousand. Okay, twenty thousand dollars is less, or ten thousand is less. 10, so ten. So you go with ten thousand. So that will be your limitation. But let's say you bought the house for um, hundred thousand somewhere. Okay, what is two percent of hundred thousand? Two thousand. So what? Two thousand is less than ten thousand. So you go with two thousand. So that's the difference. Um, they call it diminish or safe harbor. So diminish is twenty five hundred dollars, or you choose safe harbor. You have to. Yeah, you have to attach an election stating their in, uh, your intent um, to which one you want to use and you cannot revoke it anymore. That's what it says. So you have to choose which one you want. Do you like the minis or do you want a safe harbor? And then choose, check that box and you stick to it. When they say a timely filed tax return, does that mean you can't do it if you're filing an, a, an extension? No, as soon as you start being late on your tax returns, you are not qualified to enjoy any of these favorable options. That has to be the you kill your options, yeah. You are a bad, bad guy, so they don't like that. 
So here is an example, maybe. Um, so Vent rents out a condo that he uh, once used as his main home. He wins on a just basis in his home. He's 80,000, so he bought it many years ago, right? During the year, Vince paid $200 to replace a screen door and $1,000 to replace a furnace. So a furnace definitely going to work for a long time, right? So it's a capitalization. Vince can use the safe harbor under the repair regs because it's on adjusted basis in the home, does not exceed a million dollars, obviously. It's just 80. And the $1,200 he spent during the year does not exceed $1,600, which is 2% of $80,000, right? So either way, he can expense the whole thing right away. By attaching a statement to his return that he intends to use the safe harbor to deduct the entire $1,200 as rental expense, means does not have to worry about whether any of the costs might instead be considered as improvement rather than a refund. And the reason IRS is picky about this because it doesn't want you to spend a lot of money and call it expense all of a sudden. And that year you show very little income and pay no taxes or very little tax. Yeah. Okay. The rule just described um, that the rental property is used exclusively for or available for use by rent paying tenants. Sometimes, guess what? An individual rents only part of the property, which is very common, right? Now what? In that situation, um, let's say duplex, rents one unit and lives in the other. So in such uh, instances, the taxpayer must allocate expenses between rental and personal use. Normally you do that based on square footage. That's the best way to do it. Um, the taxpayer then deducts the rental portion of each expense against rental income and can deduct the per a personal portion of the mortgage interest and real estate property tax as itemized deduction, assuming he is itemizing. If he's not itemizing, then forget about it. Some expenses are easy to split between rental and personal use, like uh, uh, repairs. If you do repairs on your personal property, then it's personal expense. If you do repair on the rental property, then it's rental property expense, uh, maintenance expense. Other expenses like real estate property tax depreciation are harder to divide between rental property and personal use. So you will use square footage. So here is an example. Marvin rents one room in his home. The area of the rented room is 140 square foot. The area of the entire home is 1400 square feet. So it's easy for 140 out of 1400 is 10%. The expenses related to the home will be divided using that 10%. Uh, the real estate tax, uh, you can deduct only 10% of it, which is $200. Um, and the, where is the $1,800 going of the real estate tax in itemized deduction schedule A, assuming he's itemized. But yes, one thing is interesting here. Let's read the last sentence. It says the itemized portion is subject to $10,000 cap. Remember in Schedule A, you have a $10,000 cap on uh, state taxes that you pay, including. But if you are using that $200 for rental Schedule E, property tax deduction, there is no cap whatsoever. And you can convert your personal home after many years of using as personal home, all of a sudden to a rental property and buy a bigger home, right? So the rental property 
the personal home that became rental property from that day will be counted as uh, rental property. So in September, Sylvia moved out of her home. Sylvia listed her home for rent on October 1st. And on November 1st, she rented into, she entered into a two years list. So November and December. Sylvia can deduct 25% uh, oh, this is her home for rent on mm -hmm. October. Oh, from the moment that he rented, listed as a rental property on October, October is also included because she moved out already and she listed this as a rental property. So guess what? Mm -hmm. Starting October 1st, anything happens to his home, it will be rental property issue. Make sense? So the whole October, November, December is all included. Assuming maybe she did, she cannot find the tenant for six months. Guess what? The whole six months still is included even she couldn't find a tenant for six months. Um, so Sylvia can deduct 25%, which is October, November, December, uh, for real estate, insurance, depreciation against the rental income she receives during the year. She also can deduct any other expenses like mortgage interest, utilities, et cetera, allocated to the last three months of the year. Sylvia can deduct the personal portion, which is the remaining 75% uh, from January through um, September, uh, of interest and property tax in her itemized deduction schedule. So far so good? Okay, let's keep going. Rental of vacation homes. So a special rule, uh, rules apply when taxpayers rent out their homes for part of the year. So what's going on? Um, if you rent the property for less than 15 days, what would you do? If you rent your property less than 15 days, then here is the word. Do not report the rental income and do not deduct any rental expense. Got it? So whatever income you made for that 15 days, do not report it. Whatever expense happened for that 15 days, do not report it. No income, no expense. Okay, so that's about that. Let's go. So here is an example. Benton rents his vacation home for 12 days during the year and personally used it for 80 days. The rest of the year, the home sits vacant. Benton collects rent of $3,000 for that 12 days. Um, he also had home mortgage interest, real estate taxes, utilities, depreciation. Um, if you want to count it, depreciation, because if you don't rent it, you don't depreciate it. Remember that part? But since Benton rents to the property for less than 15 days, he does not report the $3,000 rental income. Benton cannot deduct, can only deduct as itemized deduction, assuming he's itemizing, the $6,000 of home mortgage interest as his second home and $1,800 of real estate property tax as his second home. So the utility expense and depreciation will be useless. Yes. How does Airbnb work with this? Airbnb, how is it working? Yeah, like for example, if someone bought a property and then they did it with the intent of renting it as an Airbnb. And so it's a rental property then. But if the stays were less than 15 days and- They rent it for less than 15 days? Per, per person they get. 
Or do you mean like- No, 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 days? per year. Oh. 15 days per year. Oh. Less than 15 days per year. That means 14 days, 13 days, 12 days for the whole year. The rest has to stay vacant and then you don't report anything. However, just be careful on this example. It says the $6,000 mortgage interest and the real estate tax that you pay, it will be in a schedule A as a second home. Remember if you have a second home, uh, a, uh, like a, a boat or RV, you, those are considered as second home. And uh, that will be property tax or mortgage interest, whether you pay for those second home, it will be um, deductible on your schedule A. Okay, property rented more than 14 days. Now what happens? Like Airbnb or normal rental property. What was it? So taxpayers who rent their main home for vacation homes for more than 14 days during the year report the rental income on their personal tax returns. So you have to show the rental income. Expenses related solely, solely to rental activities like advertising or commission can be deducted against rental income. All other expenses must be allocated between rental and personal. So if you pay for advertisement for finding a tenant or paying commission to real estate property uh, agents, that is specifically for rental property. So you can deduct 100%. But if you pay for property tax and mortgage and everything else, those gonna be uh, allocated based on the usage of personal and rental. So the internal uh, revenue code says uh, taxpayers need to allocate expenses other than interest tax uh, other than interest taxes and casualty losses on the basis of days the property is used during the year. Um, to compute the rental portion of expenses like utilities, repairs, and depreciation, taxpayers multiply the expense by the ratio of numbers of days rented for fair rental price to the number of days of use during the year. So um, number of fair rental days divided by the number of days used during the year, you get percentage of allocation to rental activity. We get an example. The code does not allow how to allocate, uh, do, does not address how to allocate interest, tax, and casualty losses between rental and personal use. The IRS publication 527 suggests taxpayers use the same method used to allocate other expenses, which is this. The courts, however, have allowed interest and taxes to be allocated based on days rented to the number of days in the year. For purpose of this chapter, the same ratio days rented by days used is used to allocate the expenses between rental and personal use. So it's a little bit kind of two options available because court is uh, treating this differently. Court says you can go with days rented to the number of days in the year. Let's say you rented it for 30 days and the number of days in the year is 365 days. So you can go 30 out of 365. That's what court will let you do. But IRS says, no, you can use the same thing in here, which is number of fair rental days compared to other number of days used. Let's look at an example, maybe. Valley rents out his vacation home for 120 days during the year. He personally uses it for 80 days. So guess what? 120 is rental, 80 days is personal. So Valley collects rents of $12,000 and incurs the following expenses. Home mortgage interest, real estate taxes, utilities, 
depreciation, and the total. So Valley allocates 60% of expenses, which is 120 out of 200. Where is 200 coming from? 200 is the denominator here, which is 120 other, uh, plus 80. 120 plus 80 is 200. Rental days, 120 out of 200 used days, it will be 60% ratio. So 60% ratio, he deducts $8,580, which is $14,300 times 60% ratio as a rental expense. And IRS suggests to do that. Valley can potentially deduct the rest of the real estate taxes, which is the 40% of 2,500 and that's thousand dollars um, and itemized in, in an itemized deduction. Um, also, he may be able to deduct the rest of home mortgage interest, which is um, $8,000 times 40%, um, which is $3,200, if the home is selected as Valley's second home. So this part, the interest is important because if, if let's say you have three properties, now you have to choose which one is your second home. Let's say you have one property in Florida, one property in Texas, and one property in California. You live in California, that's good. That's your first home. But which one is your second home, Florida or Texas? Assuming this home is, let's say in Florida, and he choose this as second home, then he can also deduct 40% of interest in his itemized deduction. But if this is not his second home, then he cannot deduct that 40% of $8,000 mortgage interest. However, he can deduct, um, real estate property tax, um, uh, as itemized deduction. Because the property tax, um, uh, is deductible item anyway. Yes. Can you change? Which one is your second home of the year? Or once you decide that's your second home, you can't change it. I think you can change, but not flip flopping every year. You can. I'm not sure, but I think you can change it. Um, but you have to put in your tax return that this is my second home. Now, for example, you have three homes and then you, you choose one of them as a second home, but then you sold that. So now your third home becomes your second home. Make sense? So you couldn't just, let's say you didn't sell it and you just kept it like that. You can just say, I don't want this one to be my second home anymore. I want the other one to be. You can do that? Yes, you can, because you can say the previous home that was my second home, now it becomes rental. So I rent it out. So therefore my second home is my third home. Should something happening in between, otherwise something happens, then you go with that flow. Okay, a rental day is any day the taxpayer rents the property for a fair rental price. Here it gets a little bit complicated. Um, when it's rented to a friend or relative. So if you rent it to a friend or relative for a rent, fair rental price, then it is a rental day. Days that property is offered for rental, but not actually rented, do not count as days rented at fair rental price. 
So if you are counting your rental days, count it exactly the day that tenant moves in. If it is vacant for three months, that's not fair rental days. That is unused days. Got it? So in previous example, remember they rented for 120. That those are exact days that the tenant was in the property. So what is a fair rental price? A fair rental price is the amount of rent that an unrelated person would be willing to pay to use the property. Very simple, right? If the rent charged is substantially less than the rent received on similar properties, it might not be considered a fair rental price. The following questions can be used to determine whether two properties are similar. Are their properties used for the same purpose? Uh, are, are they same size, same condition, similar furnishings, similar locations? Generally answering no to any of these questions means that two properties are not similar. That means location is important. If you are looking at the same size, but one of them is in Orange County and the other one is in um, downtown LA, then Orange County obviously location is better. So you cannot say this is the same similar uh, comparison. So the fair rental price, needs to be compared with something similar. How about the expenses limited for certain vacation homes? So many people, they have vacation homes. When the property is considered as residence, rental expenses are deductible only to the extent of rental income. Disallowed expenses carry over to offset rental income in future tax year. So if it's a vacation home uh, and you have a little bit of rental income, the expenses will be used up to the rental income. The remaining expenses will carry forward. A vacation home qualifies as a residence if the number of personal days exceeds the greater of 14 days or 10% of fair rental days. Uh, let's say if you rent it for uh, 100 days, um, so 100 days, 10% of 100 days is 10 days. The greater of 14 or 10 days. So in that case, the greater of 14 days. So the vacation home qualifies as residence if it exceeds the greater of 14 days or 10% of fair rental days. Thus, if taxpayers' personal days exceeds both the 14 days and 10% of fair rental days, then the property is considered as a residence. When the property is treated as re residence, then the personal portion of the mortgage interest can be deducted as an itemized deduction if the property is chosen as taxpayer's second home. So if it's a residence and it's a second home, the mortgage interest can be deducted in Schedule A. When the property does not qualify as residence, the personal portion of the interest cannot be deducted because it's not a residence anymore and you cannot deduct a uh, personal portion of the interest, mortgage interest in your schedule A. In order to properly determine whether the taxpayer's home qualifies as residence, it is important to understand what days count as personal days. So personal use includes days when the taxpayer donates uh, use of the property to a charitable organization. That's a personal days. Personal use also includes days when the property is used by the owner. That's a personal day. Unless the owner is working full time to repair or maintain the property. So if the owner is there 
because of doing ha handyman work himself, then that's not um, personal day. A member of an owner's family, like his son, unless the family members pays a fair rental price and the family member use the property as his or her main home, that's another story because he's paying fair rental price and member of families staying there for as main home. But a member of uh, owner's family stays there below fair market rent, then it is personal day. Family members include sibling, brother, sister, um, parents, grandparents, and children, grandchildren. Anyone who has a reciprocal agreement that allows, allows the owner to use some other dwelling unit, like home exchange. Uh, in that case, it is a personal use also. Because they are have an agreement to have exchange. So you you go to Florida in my vacation home, I go to your vacation home in Canada. You see, that's exchange. Anyone who pays less than a fair rental price to use the property, that means again you give it for free legally, and that is also a personal use. So let's look at an example. Ella owns a house that she rents to her son. Son pays a fair rental price to use the house as his main home. Okay, that's not personal use. Ella does not consider the son's use of the house personal days since the son is paying the fair rental price and is using it as uh, his main home. <clears throat> Another example. June and Jay own a vacation home that they personally use 24 days during the year. So far so good, 24 days. During the part of the year, the following occupants use the home. The home was vacant during the rest of the year. Fair rental price is $125 a night in that area. Okay, June's parents will pay no rent. That's 32 days, that's personal. Friends and Lindens who paid rent of 2000 for 40 days. That's not good enough, right? 40 times 125, yeah, it will be more. So that's cheap, so it's personal. Jay's brother who paid rent of 875. That is seven times 125. That's 875, right? So that's fair price. Unrelated persons who paid rent of 7,500 for 60 days. Again, 60 times 125. That should be about, I think, 7,500. So let's see. The 60 days home was used by unrelated persons are not personal days, obviously, because 60 times 125, and it's unrelated. It's unrelated, then whatever it is, it's fair price. Um, since the tenant paid $120, $125 a night. Although Jay's brother paid a fair rental price, his seven days, count as personal day since he's a family member and did not use the home as his main home. Wow. Okay, so uh, that's good. So Jay's brother paid a fair rental price. Uh, his seven days still count as personal since it's, fa it's a family member. Okay, so the only thing it looks like right now is that 60. The parents did not pay fair rental price, so nor did they use the home as their main home. Um, so that's all of question. Thus their 32 days, their 32 days uh, count as personal days. The 40 days that the home is used by Linden's friends count as personal days also since they didn't pay 
the fair rental price. So the Linda's total personal days equals to what? Uh, 24 themselves, plus 32 their parent, 40 Linda's friend that paid less than fair market value, and seven days for the brother, because brother is a family member. So 24 plus 32 plus 40 plus seven. That's 103 days of personal days. Since the 103 personal days exceeds 14 days or 10% of fair rental days, fair rental days is 60 plus seven, right? That, that's what they really gave it to rent. So fair rental days that you collect money is 10% of that is 6.7 days. So 14 days is um, um, like um, higher. So they go with the higher of 14 days, but 14 days is the very less than 103 days personal days. So the vacation home qualifies as residence. As soon as this qualifies as residence, the rental expenses will be only limited to the uh, income that they generate, not more than that. So how, how much income do they have? Uh, they have income of uh, 2,000 plus 875 plus 7,500. So if they have more expense than this for this property, they have to carry forward. Remaining expense will be carried forward. <clears throat> so it's, it's getting complicated, right? So same facts in example nine, except the five of the days the Linden spent at the vacation home, they spent making repairs to the property. You see, um, Linden spent for out of these 24 days here, five days was for repairing, not for fun. These five days no longer count as personal days. The Linden's personal days are reduced to 98. Out of 103, now it is only 98. However, the home still qualifies as a resident because 98 days is still more than 14 days. So still is residence. Bruce rent his vacation home for 200 days during the year. On 40 of the 200 days, Bruce's sister paid a fair rental price to use the house. The other 160 days also were rented at a fair rental price. Bruce treats the days his sister rents the house as personal days because it's his sister. Since she is relative and does not use the house as main home. The 40 personal days exceeds the greater of 14 days or 10% of 200. So 40 is 10% of 200 is 20 days. And 40 personal days are more than 20 days, right? Because it's more than 20 days, therefore it is a residence, qualifies as residence. And because it qualifies as res residence, then the rental expenses will be limited to the income. Accordingly, even though 100% of rental expense are deductible, since all 200 days the home was used during the year were rented at a fair rental price, Bruce can only deduct the rental expenses to extend on rental income. The remaining expenses will be carried forward to the future years. We're good? From June 1, 
This is the last exam for today. From June 1 through October 31st, 153 days. Dennis rents her cabin used as vacation home and receives a fair rental price. So 153 days fair rental price. Dennis used the cabin five days during the year. Then his parents stayed at the cabin for 12 days in May. In deciding whether the cabin qualifies as a residence, personal days include days the parent used the cabin, 12 days. Therefore, the total number of personal days are 17 days, five plus 12. Dennis treats the cabin as residence since her 17 personal days exceeds the greater of 14 days or 10% of 153, which is 15.3 days. So 17 is bigger than 15.3. Therefore, it's a residence. That means any rental expense more than rental income will be carried forward. This, therefore, Dennis can deduct the rental portion of the expenses on the cabin only to the extent of rental income. She carries over any excess rental expense to the next year. In allocating expenses between rental and personal use, Dennis allocates 90%, which is 150 out of 170 they use, right? 153 plus uh, 17. That's total days used. The rest cabin was empty. <coughs> so 153 out of 170, that will be 90% ratio. So in allocating expenses between rental and personal, then it allocates 90% of the expenses to the rental activity. Because the cabin qualifies as a residence, Dennis can deduct the personal portion of the mortgage interest, 10% as an itemized deduction. Why 10%? Because 90% is rental, make sense? 90% is rental, 10% is personal. So just 10% of mortgage interest can be used in itemized deduction schedule A. If she selects the cabin as second home, of course. Dennis can deduct 10% of the real estate taxes on the cabin as itemized deduction if her total state and local taxes does not exceed that $10,000 cap. Okay, so we are good for today, I believe. That was a lot of information, huh? Complicated. You cannot memorize this, but there is a publication 527 for rental properties, I believe. So all you need to do is not memorizing it, but just understanding where to get information from when it's needed. Maybe you don't have a taxpayer to use this information. Yes, but you forget everything. But one day you have a taxpayer with these situations coming up, then you open the publication and look at it and to remember how everything works. So don't panic, say, oh, who's gonna memorize all this stuff? But general knowledge is important, right? But if you ask me next week, I will say, uh, let me look at the book again, right? Because it's complicated. So you have to look at the book again, uh, just to answer a question properly. Uh, if I have a client next week, definitely I will look at the book again just to make sure I remember everything before I do tax preparation for that client. Okay, uh, hopefully you like it. See you next week for the remaining of this chapter, which is interesting chapter. Yeah.